Sometimes this has been misunderstood as a sort of effort from the outside to impose, uh, but really nothing should be imposed from outside. And we actually now do have a growing range of countries uh, from Sudan, as we heard from Her Excellency yesterday, uh, to Pakistan, uh, from Kenya to Trinidad and Tobago. So across a whole range of regions uh, and experiences who are actually developing these plans and getting rich uh, experiences. Um, so we'd like this session to be an interactive discussion uh, on what we've learnt both about developing uh, such plans and then how to implement them and ensure we have real impact uh, on the ground. In the UK, uh, we've very much been early adopters of the idea that governments should have strong uh, multifaceted approaches uh, set out within a clear policy framework. We've been continuously refining our preventative efforts uh, ever since we first launched our prevent approach uh, in the UK in 2003 and more recently broadening that to wider extremism uh, as captured in our counter extremism strategy of 2015. And the links between those um, will be made even clearer uh, when we publish the re refreshed version of the UK's counter terrorism strategy contest, which will be published in the coming month on the anniversary of the London Bridge attack. Um, our experience nationally of those terrible attacks shows how essential it is uh, that a holistic uh, and joined up approach uh, is taken to address the drivers of violent extremism. And I'm sure that's matched in your experiences and that of countries that are even more at the front line of tackling uh, violent extremism. Internationally, uh, the UK continues to support uh, UN efforts to develop effective plans of action. And this has gone through a number of phases. Firstly, at the UN General Assembly in September 2016, our Foreign Secretary and his Emirati counterpart uh, announced the establishment of a task force on PCV national action plans, led by Patrick Lynch, who is with us today, uh, Director at Hadaya. And the task force has since grown in scope and has been supported by a range of countries, including funding from Australia, the EU, Canada, the UK, and the United States. One year later, last September, the PCVE National Action Plans Task Force and UNDP signed an MOU uh, which has increased the reach of this work through UNDP's significant global footprint and drawing on the knowledge and the expertise of UNDP staff and of course sharing the task force's own expertise on this theme. And it's great to have so many UNDP country directors, uh, regional and field representatives uh, in the room. Yesterday, I was inspired to hear the shared vision um, espoused by UNDP Administrator Steiner uh, and Under Secretary General Voronkov, and to see that vision captured in the MOU that they signed yesterday uh, between UNDP and UNOCT. And I'd like to congratulate all of those involved, uh, in particular Sasha Avanesov uh, here at the front, uh, who's really been doing excellent work pioneering this whole of UN approach uh, to PVE and launching the global program on PVE. And this, this partnership has the potential now to move to global efforts in developing national action plans to a new level. And we're looking forward to hearing from our UNDP and UNOCT uh, representatives on this panel, uh, Jessica Banfield and Mehdi Khani, about the lessons uh, that they are identifying that will help make this partnership deliver tangible results on a scale not yet witnessed. But today we need to go further um, and we need to identify together how to ensure that these international efforts are designed to be fully supportive of the needs of each country in the right way. So I'm delighted we're also joined on the panel by the head of the first regional center of excellence on CVE, that at EGAD. And Simon is well placed to shape our discussion on the challenges around effective implementation of these plans. How do we develop sustainable cross-government structures to prevent violent extremism? How do we capture the right analysis? How do we design appropriate activities that respond to that to reduce the threats? And crucially, how to harness mechanisms to collaborate with civil society and with communities. So I'm going to ask each of our panels to really touch on the lessons that they've um, experienced and then look forward to what we can do together uh, for the future. So without further ado, may I ask our first uh, speaker, uh, Patrick Lynch, to set out the lessons as seen from the task force uh, on national action plans um, to prevent and counter violent extremism uh, and how those of us in the room can contribute or benefit from the task force work. Patrick. 
Thank you, Alistair. <coughs> yes, thank you, Alistair. Thank you also to our host UNDP and the Norwegian government for this excellent event. My name is Patrick Lynch. I am the UK representative at Hedaya and in November 2016 launched its first satellite office in Washington, D.C., which also established the PCVE National Action Plans Task Force, which we run jointly with the Global Centre for Cooperative Security. Let me just try and get this. Okay, excuse me, people. <laughs> Sorry for the technical glitches. Okay, there we go, thank you. Okay, I too would like to begin by commending the work of UNDP and also warmly, warmly welcoming its MOU with UNOCT. I think that the combination of the different strengths of both of these organisations has real potential to increase delivery and rollout on this theme. And of course, many of those who were involved in the MOU were also instrumental in the Secretary General's PVE Plan of Action in January 2016, and that certainly gave fresh impetus to the work that we've been doing on national action plans. So thank you to all of those involved. This is something that, that has always been a core priority for Hedaya, and quite simply, we think that governments must take a joined up and cross-government approach to preventing and countering violent extremism. And a national action plan can provide the overarching framework for those cross-government efforts. It also makes clear that this is not just an issue for security agencies. Necessarily, effective PCVE relies on collaboration across different parts of government and also civil society. Since 2014, we have worked with over 20 governments to develop the facilitation of national action plans and with funding from Canada, the UAE, UK, US, and a number of others, the task force is able to provide pro bono technical support and training that draws on emerging international good practice. We have developed a suite of research and training material that is open to others and can help to guide partners from initial research and analysis through to implementation. And we apply a phased programmatic approach that is always tailored to the needs of specific partners. The approach has to be culturally appropriate and also has to reflect a realistic appraisal of the resources that are available for implementation. And we would also stress that the process of developing a national action plan can often be as important as the plan itself. Bringing together all the relevant stakeholders from ministries and, soci and civil society, <coughs> giving them an opportunity to provide valuable input helps to foster broader involvement <coughs> that is necessary for effective implementation. And it is also important that there is an honest and reflective assessment of the drivers of violent extremism, as a number of speakers have noted. And this has to include the, the role of governments in increasing as well as reducing the threat. Another central theme is engaging communities and taking proactive steps to prevent extremism through local partnerships. And key content for the task force is devoted to promoting the common understanding of building community resilience. The emphasis has to be on achievable objectives and establishing policy and practice that is sustainable. The measure of a national action plan is not in how well it reads or resonates, but on the specific on the ground activity that flows from it. The task force is a flexible resource. We can work with partner governments through the full process from research and analysis to implementation and evaluation. And we can also concentrate on any of the stages in between. We can offer training and other advice on a national or regional basis and can work with countries that are seeking to develop or further develop a national action plan or perhaps add a prevention element to an existing wider counter-terrorism strategy. So, what are the core elements of a national action plan? We would emphasize that a national action plan is not a simple solution. However, if it is locally driven, culturally literate, realistic in its aims, and has a solid evidence base that draws on local understanding of the drivers, then we have the potential for success. It is vital that there is a solid understanding of the structural conditions 
and associated grievances which make, which make individuals and communities more vulnerable to being drawn towards violence. And it is vital to understand the pool of violent extremist groups. What is it that draws individuals, particularly young males, to the dynamic of the violent extremist groups? This is one of a number of core principles in our guidance documents, which we are happy to share. And those documents also stress the importance of clear structures, including a clear understanding of who is in the lead. In many countries where we work, there are different agencies and ministries inevitably competing for space, competing for funding, and claiming they are the national PCVE lead. A clear direction from the executive on this issue is a vital starting point. And it is also important to map and assess current regional, national, and municipal strategies. What is out there, what is working, where a plan hasn't been implemented properly, what is the reason for this? But we're realistic, and by the very nature of this context, there will always be significant challenges to developing a national action plan. Governments will have competing priorities, and we must accept that security actors will be sceptical, especially in locations where the immediacy of the violence and the scale of the threat can make discussions of holistic approaches and joined-up government sound rather unrealistic. I would emphasise two key approaches to deal with these challenges. Firstly, the approaches have to be accessible and have to be understandable to the layperson. Secondly, effective activity can only happen if we encourage and initiate what for the purposes of these remarks I would call the philosophical switch towards PCVE. And I just want to unpack that a little. So on the first key element of accessibility, as we've discussed over the last two days, uh, we accept that we should always be directed by a solid evidence base, by proper localised assessment and analysis of the drivers of violent extremism. And we know that there are a myriad of interrelated factors, variables that are difficult to isolate or quantify. However, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. And it also doesn't mean that the tools we use and the questions we ask need to be equally complicated. If we are seen as too academic or even appear to be esoteric in our approach, then we lose our target audience and we lose the partners that we need. As a starting point in the task force, we find it useful in the early stages to simply talk about push and pull factors. What are the structural conditions that make any given environment more conducive to the growth and existence of violent extremism and what are those catalyst factors? What are the attraction factors that exploit and interact with those structural conditions to draw individuals and communities towards violent extremism? <coughs> Thank you. Questions like these are easily understood and where it works best can be a starting point for honest analysis of the drivers of violent extremism that can steer effective responses. But in order for it to work best, and for effective activity to be initiated, I would contend that the second key element has to be present. We have to encourage people to see preventive aspects, not as a vehicle for a particular worldview, but as a national security imperative. Above all else, pursuance of preventive approaches is a simple cause and effect equation. If we reduce and address the causal factors, we make ourselves safer. So how do we apply these two key elements to national action plans development? For national action plans, the empirical evidence as well as the logic is clear. If governments fail to address <coughs> these structural conditions, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. If governments fail to address <coughs> these structural conditions, then they put themselves at risk. And we should not be afraid to say that. Two important responses. Firstly, in very simple terms, never do what your enemy wants you to do. Avoid being provoked into a discriminatory or overly kinetic response, because that is the aim of violent extremist groups. And secondly, as an assurance, we must emphasise and re-emphasise that PCVE national action plans are not an alternative to the rule of law. Every functioning society requires investigation, prosecution, tribunal and detention. PCVE approaches seeks to fill the gaps and deal with the root causes, not to replace the rule of law. And just finally, I think it's important with national action plans 
that we do not try to present them as a magic bullet. They are not an end in itself. But I'd like to close by highlighting three more readily attainable objectives in the National Action Plan process. Firstly, the sensitisation of governments. Increasing understanding of violent extremism, especially with regard to the role of governments, is a measure that can aid prevention. Secondly, the process of drafting a National Action Plan inevitably requires cross-government drafting committees or working groups. This can be a sustainable legacy product of the National Action Plan process, a cross-government ministry group that can deal with emerging challenges. And finally, a National Action Plan should always increase PCV activity. It should be an entry point for a range of specific evidence-based work, whether it's on education, prisons, policing or numerous other areas. Clearly set out priorities can focus government uh, action and can also increase and better coordinate donor support. So in closing, a National Action Plan where it is realistic, culturally literate and locally led can bring tangible benefits. It can provide a framework for and bring fresh impetus to PCV activities in priority countries. Working together and learning from each other, we can further develop international good practice on this theme. Thank you. Patrick, thank you very much. And I'm sure there'll be um, various interesting uh, challenges and questions around how we take that approach forward into its next phase. Um, so now I'm going to turn to uh, Simon to give us uh, his perspective um, from being one of the first regions, not just to develop a centre, but also uh, regional approaches uh, to preventing and countering violent extremism. Simon, please. Thank you very much, uh, Lester. Let me first start by thanking uh, UNDP for inviting uh, IGAD and myself. Also, I thank uh, the government and people of Norway. And... Um, let me get straight to the business because the chair has warned me that uh, I need to be very specific and get right to the point. I'll give you from, I'll speak from a practical experience. Um, my good friend uh, has given the theoretical part, how you need to do it. I'll be giving you the practical element of how we have done it. First, let me start because Alista has mentioned we are the first center in the African continent, the center of excellence uh, for, countering, for preventing and countering violent extremism. Uh, and let me just give you a little bit of background because we have been up and running for one year and a half. Uh, when the people of the region, and especially members of civil society and government, requested that they needed a regional platform where issues of preventing and countering violent extremism would be institutionalized. And they made this request very firmly when President Obama visited the region and visited specifically Kenya and Ethiopia. And his visit in Kenya, he met members of civil society. I'm happy that Fozia is here, and she is actually the one who posed the question to President Obama if the region could get a center of excellence for preventing and countering violent extremism. The US government and uh, President Obama had that request, and I remember tell him telling the civil society and young people in that meeting, yes, we can, and yes, it was done. Eric Rosat, who is in this room, uh, took that challenge, and I think he was assigned that responsibility. And in the region, we credit him for helping us prepare and get this center up and running and prepare the initial documents. So that's basically about the center. And I don't want uh, to bog you just telling you a little bit about the center. Uh, let me get now to the personal experience in terms of developing the strategy. And I first want to table evidence that a strategy exists. It's right here. And I'll be giving a few copies to the chair who will give them, distribute them according to his discretion. But the other copies are also available uh, on our website. When the center, and the center was approved and it became um, imperative that we are going to have a center, again the people of the region, we asked, what do we need to do first? And the people of the region said, we need first a clear strategy, a roadmap of how the region is going to be dealing with issues of preventing and countering violent extremism. And therefore, we approached our colleagues who are great partners, UNDP, I'm happy Ozonia is here, uh, Simon, and I remember we sat in Nairobi uh, and tried to find out how we sat in Nairobi, we sat in Addis, and tried to find how do we come with this. 
and we said it must be owned by the region. This must come from the region. And therefore, we are back to the process of having this regional strategy. The first was to write to our government to give us key experts in each of their government. Each government, and I must add, despite the fact that Tanzania is not a member of IGAD, Tanzania requested to be part of that process. And we got key people from Sudan, because I can see the minister here, General Dr. Jamal, was there. I don't want to mention all of them, because I would take, they were key people, experts. And we embarked on the process. We got a, a, a regional person to lead as a consultant. But we felt also we needed to gel with the region and also international. We got somebody else who is outside the region, and we embarked on the process. We went around the countries of the region, all the countries. We talked to over 800 people, both state actors and non-state actors. And they gave us their views, what they need to see in their strategy, what are those ingredients they want to see in their strategy. Then we compiled the first draft, and this first draft went to 202 peer reviewers, experts, both from the region and outside the region. I see many of you who read and gave us good feedback. Alista here is one of them. The UK government gave us very good feedback, and your governments and your entities gave us very good feedbacks. Then we called back the experts on 1st and 2nd of March in Djibouti of last year, and they looked at that strategy again, gave their views, and approved it and validated it. Uh, I'm happy that even Hedaya was represented by the Deputy Director Ivo and Thompson were there. And then we took this to the Committee of Ambassadors of IGAD. They approved it and the Council of Ministers. And we have been having it. And on uh, 25th of last month, as the center was being inaugurated, the strategy was inaugurated. There are key issues, and I don't want to get in this strategy. First is that this strategy we have been daring enough. Yesterday we talked about not having a definition on all, and we said we are going to take the bull by its horn. We are going to give a working definition. It's not perfect, and we hope that as people read the strategy, there will be more criticism and more feedback on how to improve the definition. I don't want to take you through the definition. It's there, and, and it both defines violent extremism and preventing and viol uh, uh, countering violent extremism, and what are those patients. The strategy has uh, key pillars. One is building the capacity both regionally and, and, and nationally for the region. Secondly is research analysis that we, the more we try to analyze this problem, the less we understand it, then we need evidence-based research that is able to inform us. The other pillar is building local capacity. The local cap the capacity has to be built. We have to go through down to the grassroots and build that capacity. Uh, the other pillar is dealing with those underlying issues, be they political, socioeconomic, all those have need to be dealt with. The other pillar deals with also issues of rule of law, that I, I don't need to em overemphasize that, that it's important we deal with issues of rule of law. And we also need to have partnership. I want to say we, having a strategy is one thing, or having an action plan. The next critical issue is implementing. I want to tell you we have gotten down to implementing this strategy, and I don't want to take you, bog you with. We have built a network of civil society. We have a digital, uh, a, a, a digital hub for them where they're able to connect. We just, uh, last week I came from Mombasa where we build a good network of local researchers who will help, and it's from each country. We want to build a good network and we're working with different partners, USAID and others, to build this critical uh, uh, network. So I, I will not bog you with much more implementation. Let me get also specific what lessons we have learned from our countries of region. Let me first say that Kenya and Somali from our region are the two countries that have a, 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 a action plan or strategies. And each has an experience. Kenya was the first one and started early enough and got a small group. And yesterday, as we were doing the MOU, I was reminded the, the, the same Kenya did, picked a few people and went and had a strategy and also kept it secret, the way the MOU yesterday was kept secret. So uh, they, uh, they did not want to expose it to, uh, uh, to many people. Uh, and this, our st as we went around getting views, is that I say the regional strategy was a catalyst. 
and members of civil society started asking, and where is the copy of that strategy? As we might start asking for the copy of the MOU of yesterday, and soon Benson and the team, who is right here uh, uh, from the National Counterterrorism Center of Kenya, gave the people and, 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 and the Kenyan people the strategy, and they started criticizing it. The Kenya strategy is unique because it came from the governments and the people trying to get it themselves, not from any external. They started. Somalia is interesting because it came from external, and they were told it's important you have a strategy, and uh, it was even difficult to do it in Somalia, so they went, they met first in Djibouti, they met again in Nairobi. So, and there was, for those who followed, there was a lot of criticism, especially from diaspora, we have not involved, they were all that. Um, Djibouti, we learned the lesson. And Djibouti, where the center has been active, we said we want the locals to lead. We want the people from the, there to lead. Tanzania has had an experience. Uh, this is where UNDP must accept criticism, is that uh, 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 took first uh, somebody from outside the region or outside the country, and the Tanzanian said, wait, we have intellectuals who can do it. And that looked like it has told. So what are the lessons that we need to learn? And I don't want to go very specific is that we need to ensure that we involve the people who are going to be the end consumers of this. Let's not assume that these countries don't have expertise. These countries have intellectuals, they have professors like uh, our professor here, who have been educated in the same universities, be they London School of Economics, being a Harvard, they're back in that region, very intelligent, very smart, they can do this. Let's not assume they don't have knowledge, let's work with them. We're not saying they don't need external support, let's try to pair. It's to pair somebody from the region or that country. I tell people, even I can't go to Tanzania and do a strategy for them. Let's pair people with the regional and the people from there. And that's when we are going to be, have a strategy that is owned and people feel they are part of it. Thank you very much. So I think you've uh, set us at least two, uh, if not more, challenges, but particularly that aspect of local ownership, a really key dimension uh, that we'd like to explore uh, in the di discussion, how to make that as effective as possible. Uh, and then uh, secondly, I think a challenge to Sasha to make sure that as part of the concluding uh, 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 documents that we receive after this conference, uh, that we get the UN secret MOU between OCT and, uh, uh, and uh, UNDP, or at least a version of that that you can publish, please. So if you could send a link round that would be excellent. Very good. We're now going to pass to uh, some of our UN uh, colleagues, and I'll first ask um, for a perspective from the uh, UN Office of Counterterrorism. So please, Mehdi. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, Alistair. Um, and thank you once again to Norway and our UNDP partners for having... Uh, brought us together for these two days for very insightful and enriching discussions. Um, I am a political affairs officer in the office of Under Secretary General Voronkov, who uh, spoke yesterday at the opening and uh, highlighted how PV is one of the priorities for our office. It's a priority consistent with our mandate and also consistent with, I would like to underline, growing expectations and requests from member states themselves. And there are Norway announced uh, yesterday a very generous pledge in support of a new global PV program that uh, my office will be implementing over the next three years together with UNDP. And I'd like to take this opportunity to provide you with some more details about our approach to assisting member states in developing national action plans. Um, as a starting point, I want to underline, uh, as Mr. Voronkov did yesterday, that our work on PV is first and foremost based on the first and fourth pillar of the UN Global Counterism Strategy. And in this context, um, as Alistair already mentioned himself as well, the UN PV Plan of Action. And assisting member states' effort um, to develop preventive action is, from our perspective, a key route towards a comprehensive and balanced implementation of the strategy. And this is one of the key observations that the Secretary General has made in his recent report for the Biennial Review of the Global Counterism Strategy, a report that was published uh, last week. So in the context of the strategy, the General Assembly explicitly encouraged uh, the United Nations in 2016 to assist member states who are considering developing national and regional PVE plans of action according to their own priorities. 
And the General Assembly recommended that member states implement relevant recommendations from the UN PV Action Plan as applicable to their national context. And I would like to recall that uh, it's not only the General Assembly, but also the Security Council, which have underscored the need to address violent extremism. So we're really walking on two legs in the United Nations. And also the Council chose the phrase countering violent extremism, countering terrorism, sorry, countering violent extremism conducive to terrorism rather than PVE. The objective and the content very much coincide, in particular, the need for an inclusive approach to engage communities, civil society, youth, women, religious, and cultural leaders to promote cohesion or resilience and to counter incitement. The UN Secretary General has prioritized the threat of terrorism and the need to step up UN support for member states. Uh, in this context, establishing UNOCT was one is his first reform initiative, and he has designated our office as the UN system-wide PV focal point, and as coordinator for a whole of UN approach to ensure cohesive and comprehensive work on PV. He's also asked the UN system to put an absolute priority on uh, use, on engaging and empowering use in this context. Um, you can see on the slides a heat map of UNPV projects, and we've carried out a mapping exercise in cooperation with uh, the whole UN system to sort of uh, have a better understanding of the extent of the support that is currently provided by the UN to member states on their request uh, with regard to PV. We've identified more than 260 PV projects currently implemented by 15 different UN entities in more than 85 countries around the world. And we feel that this speaks uh, both to the interest and also the trust uh, that member states are placing in the UN uh, to provide them with support in this regard. So building on this ongoing work, we have now launched a global PV program with UNDP to assist re requesting member states over the next three years in developing uh, national and regional action plans. And this partnership uh, between UNOCT and UNDP is mutually reinforcing uh, and will allow us to uh, leverage our comparative advantage. On the one hand, uh, UNOCT's uh, policy experience and expertise can help to better align and inform UNDP implementation on the ground. And on the other hand, the UNDP's country team, resident coordinators, field knowledge, and close relationship with member states uh, will help us as it will be a significantly greater challenge for UNOCT to engage with member states otherwise. So the relationship benefits first and foremost member states and will help ensure that um, as a UN system, we can provide coordinated support. So to inform this uh, policy work, uh, we have uh, developed a uh, reference guide for the development of PV plan of actions. And the guide touches on the principles and concept of PV, uh, key UN resolutions, strategic priorities, processes, and substantive examples that are all part of creating an effective multi-tiered, multi-stakeholder plan of action. We have identified uh, many and equally important considerations when developing PV plan of actions, which the reference guide sets out as overarching principles, uh, which are shown on the slide. And a key uh, principle, if not a prerequisite, uh, is that of national ownership and the primary responsibility of member states, as was uh, emphasized yesterday in her opening remarks by Her Excellency, the State Minister from Sudan. PV plans can quickly dissolve unless political will is established and maintained throughout. Uh, other principles we've identified include that the UN should on act, on act only in a supportive role, that the plan of action should follow an inclusive and holistic approach, that action planning should be based on evidence, that it should support a wider social compact against violent extremism, that it should contribute to the fulfillment of the Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals, that it should be closely aligned and coherent with other imperative, uh, not least international human rights obligations, but also other policy agenda, such as the, U the Youth Peace and Security Agenda or the Women Peace and Security Agenda, and of course, uh, last but not least, the Do No Harm Principle. In terms of the PV policy process, we suggest breaking down the design, development, and implementation of a national PV plan in four broad steps. Um, and I will probably echo uh, many of the suggestions and lessons learned that Patrick has shared uh, with us. Uh, so first, uh, an interagency drafting committee 
needs to be established and begin by identifying relevant governmental and non-governmental partners to assess the threat and the needs. Second, the PV plan of actions uh, needs to be created along guidelines established by good practices and lessons learned which we are collecting and along the seven priority areas of the UN PV plan of action so as to tackle existing as well as emerging challenges and gaps in addressing the drivers of an extremism in a particular national context. Third, an interagency committee should act as a hub for the implementation by establishing a roadmap, priorities that clearly outline objectives, timelines, and create synergies in terms of resource allocation, especially with where those are always very limited. And fourth, the committee should monitor and be committed to evaluating the effective implementation of the plan and to update the plan as and when required. I'd like to highlight three interrelated challenges and opportunities that come along uh, in the process of creating a national plan. First, building national political will is the initial hurdle. Um, executive branches of government need to self-identify and acknowledge that van extremism poses a threat to their societies, which is not always a given. Second, ownership needs to be institutionalized. Ownership needs to be committed through the establishment of national committees, interagency bodies, to ensure planning and implementation from the beginning to the end, and that all relevant national authorities are involved. And third, we need long-term commitment to maintain the PV plan and ensure it remains relevant and effective in light of evolving circumstances. We are putting a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, national ownership as a prerequisite for legitimacy and for effectiveness. Um, however, this is not in contradiction with the need for an inclusive approach as recognized both by the General Assembly and the Security Council. National authorities need to spearhead ownership, but they should strive to engage and involve as many non-governmental stakeholders to achieve a whole of society approach, to achieve a whole of society buying for concerted, multifaceted national PV efforts. Um, in terms of the content, we recommend that the PV plan of actions uh, should be holistic. Uh, and we've heard some caveats yesterday as to uh, whether a holistic approach is very practical in the short term and whether we should look at pairing intervention on a smaller number of areas at the beginning. And we know that in the PV plan of action there are several priority areas that have been identified with a range of recommendations that I will not reiterate here. But I just want to emphasize that overlooking or lacking in one of these areas can lead to a piecemeal approach that might produce short-term gains but will fail to deliver on long-term solutions and sustainable prevention of an extremism. Um, I'd like to uh, highlight what we have found to be some key ingredients of a recipe for success, some, some good practices. Uh, first, a national plan of action should foresee and allow for localized delivery. It needs to allow for the possibility to tailor implementation to a specific context within the country perhaps within a region, within a city, or if there are urban versus rural uh, specific dynamics. Second, it's really key to invest time and energy at the very beginning in establishing a functioning, empowered, multi-sector interagency coordination uh, mechanism. This will lead to better policy formulation and better implementation with clear responsibilities and resource allocation. Third, developing and implementing a PV plan of action is a unique opportunity to build trust and dialogue between national authorities, local authorities, communities, civil society, and the private sector. It's a confidence building process and it will of course not go without difficulties and sometimes misunderstandings. Fourth, it's important not to reinvent the wheel and that's I think has been highlighted in a number of sessions yesterday and we need to build on existing policies and programs for instance, in terms of crime prevention, child protection, civic education, so, uh, social cohesion. And the PV plan of action should be coherent and mutually reinforcing with these other policies and agendas, especially those which are cross-cutting like a PV plan of action. Fifth, um, developing a PV plan of action is a learning process. And there is a wealth of experience and good practices that member states can learn from their neighbors, but also from further afar even if they may need to be adapted, and even if sometimes some cannot be transferred as such. And I think the UN here is uniquely placed to help this exchange of information and experiences. 
So I just want to conclude by uh, reiterating the readiness of our office, the UN Office of Counterterrorism, together with our partners in UNDP and the whole UN system to provide coordinating all UN support to member states. Uh, we have a clear mandate from the General Assembly. Uh, we've been designated by the Secretary General as uh, the PV focal point for the uh, UN system, and we will endeavor to serve as a hub to leverage partnerships both within the UN but also outside uh, with our partners such as uh, the PV Task Force of Veraya to mobilize the necessary resources and, and expertise. We've already been working with a number of regional organizations and member states through UN country teams and look forward to continuing this effort. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mehdi, and I think you've um, outlined very effectively how we now have international architecture in place uh, at the UN level and a whole of UN approach now that we can draw on. Uh, the question is, of course, how we make that have real impact. And so um, an easy challenge, Jessica, how do we make this have an impact? Going down to the field, please. Thank you, Alistair, and thanks to my fellow panellists and to the Oslo Governance Centre and the Government of Norway for this opportunity to contribute to the panel. So I'm going to be sharing some emerging findings from some research that we're leading at the UNDP Istanbul Regional Hub, which has the working title Emerging, uh, Developing and Implementing National Action Plans for PVE, Assessment of Practical Experience and Lessons. So this is intended as a very early stock taking of actual experience on the ground, recognizing this is a very new policy field, a very challenging policy field. Um, and a very vibrant policy field, but we believe this is the first study that's actually trying to look at how things are going, so a bit of a reality check, very much intended as a complement to the UNOCT reference guide, hope hopefully highlighting where we need to focus in terms of um, full implementation. So the methodology has been to look at 15 countries, through desk review and interviews with UNDP colleagues, which has been supported with the Oslo Governance Center's um, kind support, and then with some additional support from the Office of Counterterrorism, we have had the opportunity to do some case study research in four countries, which have been Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kyrgyzstan, the Philippines, and Tunisia. We probably could have been a bit more systematic in our selection of country cases. Um, there have been some various issues around the research, but we're now in the process of filling gaps and we'll be publishing in the next couple of months. So in terms of the findings coming out from this process, the overall assessment, of course, it's been easier to document challenges than best practices. And I think that's to be expected, given that this is such a new field of policy making and one that is really quite radical in its expectation that we see this normative shift from the security focus to a prevention approach. So in, in many respects, I think we can all agree that there's been enormous progress in a few years seeing that shift happen. We've heard from Sudan, from Kenya, from Lebanon, from IGAD itself, and from the experiences of Hedaya, that there is enormous work going on and great seriousness in trying to develop the national action plans in different countries. So it's very much a glass half full message that comes from this study. At the same time, a number of challenges definitely emerge to be expected again when we consider the ambition of the normative request and the ideal type framework that is suggested by the plan of action and by much of the guidance that we have and how that inevitably reflects and refracts when it hits the ground in terms of political and institutional realities in different country contexts and in different regions. So momentum definitely needs to be sustained so that we can really achieve the whole of government, whole of society vision of the National Action Plan and the prevention agenda including now starting to really focus to look at some of the harder areas which member states naturally find it most difficult to address in terms of putting these processes together. So with that overall assessment in mind, we have four sets of lessons that are beginning to come out from the research. The first relates to context. We heard yesterday quite a bit about the primacy of context, and it'll be no surprise to any of you to consider that actually, of course, in every single country setting, violent extremism is understood through a very sharp set of national filters related to the history, the manifestation, the type of violent extremism challenge that exists in a given country, but also the political perspectives and agenda of the ruling elites and the government who is in power at the moment and who is shaping the narrative and guiding the process. So the incentives for political actors to engage in these processes come out quite clearly from the research, um, whether or not 
to hold back at a time of an election or, or to rush forward at a time of election is one indicator of that. Um, the need for detailed political and economy analysis to help us understand those incentives and the positioning of different governments, both at the national and the regional level. We see again the national filter come out in terms of how the problem of violent extremism is defined and the partiality of that definition, which, which cuts across many of the plans that we've reviewed. So I don't want to get too much into different country contexts, but thinking regionally about the Western Balkans, one issue that we're concerned about at the Istanbul Regional Hub is the way in which the preventing violent extremism agenda as a whole is very much focused on the Islamist informed, Islamist inspired forms of violent extremism and the relatively small number of foreign terrorist fighters who've left from the Balkans as against other forms of ultra-nationalist and other ideologically inspired forms of violent extremism that simply don't get incorporated in the discussion or in the plans that are coming out. So specific groups, of course, there is the risk of stigmatization and of partial problem definition fueling longer standing divisions in society um, and challenges that may have even led to violent extremism occurring in the first place. Leaving out government's own, own role, again, naturally and understandably, government's engagement in human rights or um, perceived engagement of governments in human rights issues usually are not addressed in the plans, despite the normative um, intention to keep rights-based approaches at the centre. So all of this points to the need for the do-no-harm approach, which we've spoken about, which we've heard about in terms of its relevance to PVE programming at the local level, but really suggesting that needs to be kicked up to the macro level at the national level, that conflict sensitivity really needs to be factored into the framework for guiding these um, pieces of policy framework and the evidence base to inform that is also key so the second set of issues is around ownership and wanting to problematize that a bit so that we don't just allow ourselves to stop at the point that yes national governments should be at the fore and indeed the most successful cases that have come out from the review are those where we have top political leadership often delegating authority to a, a specially designated government institution whether especially created or already existing to lead the process and to have the authority to convene the different parts of government around the plan but in many of the cases, of course, there is a high degree of secrecy surrounding the development of the plan, even at that top political level. So much more work needs to be done there in terms of opening up the conversation. Also nesting it to the sub-national, recognizing that, of course, the manifestations of violent extremism, the drivers are often local, picking up from Sarah's point that local is itself a very complicated space and finding ways to link those in in ways that also factor in a political economy reading of dynamics. Um, often recognizing that center periphery divides may even be at the root causes of some of our violent extremism settings. Inclusivity of women, of youth remains weak, although there are examples where there have been efforts to include and consult and involve um, different factions of women and youth. When consultations are taking place, a perception that comes out from the research is that they're often um, limited to a few usual suspects at the national level. Much more needs to be done to cascade the conversations into a much more nationwide conversation and another dimension of that that comes out very clearly is the lack of involvement of political opposition or indeed parliament in the process of developing the national action plans which again hints at the politicization of the conversation. The third set of findings relates to the delivery and some of the challenges there. So referring back to Ozonia's presentation yesterday where he shared with us some earlier thinking from UNDP on the nested tiers of relevance between development programming and PVE, there's generally an absence of thinking about the different ways in which programming might respond to different kinds of violent extremism drivers. Um, linking back to the evidence base and really needing to see a sort of sharper thinking about how different kinds of interventions are going to impact at different levels. Mechanisms for monitoring in some cases are envisaged in terms of a particular government agency being tasked to monitor in a sort of general sense progress with the National Action Plan, but we didn't find any examples of meaningful results-based monitoring frameworks being put in place or being envisaged, which I think we may envisage a time in a few years from, from now where we have a backlash against this whole area if we're not able to say what have the national action plans delivered. So I think, again, it's a key area for, for attention in the next phase. 
long-standing cultural and sectoral divisions between different arms of government, which we face around the world, are presenting obstacles to the whole of government approach. The challenges of bringing rule of law, security sector, social service actors together, it takes time to overcome those silos, to put in place the necessary protocols and mechanisms for really joined up ways of working. And there's much more to be done in that area if we're really going to see the national action plans take root. And finally, the role of international partners. Obviously, it's a very delicate area for, national in, for international partners to involve themselves in. It's very much a national security sphere. In some cases, international partners, despite their own best efforts, have been entirely kept out. In others, processes are seen as being largely donor-driven. Um, cases were referred to where national action plans, and this picks up on Simon's point, are seen to have been being written by international consultants. So the way that we engage as international actors in ensuring that we contribute to the national ownership um, is another key area. There are dilemmas for international partners, how to uphold their own norms and values in this contested political space, how to try and support and encourage civil society engagement in a very sensitive area of policy making, even in contexts where civil society is typically not that involved in many other areas of policy making. So calibrating expectations and approaches. Um, we found many examples of very creative international partner engagement, and I think you've also spoken of those in the IGAD example, and some other examples where the international involvement was less constructive. So one of the areas that we'll be developing as we finalise this study will be to try and distill some lessons and recommendations, both for national, regional and also international actors. Thank you. Jessica, thank you. Um, you rose to the challenge and have really highlighted some wonderful uh, lessons there. And I think those are the sorts of things that really can help uh, frame our discussion now. Um, so as we open to the floor, I'd like to just pick up three uh, elements of what each of the panellists has touched on. Uh, first, uh, what do you think government should be doing differently based on your own lessons or those you've heard uh, as they develop uh, national action plans? Um, secondly, how can governments and civil society work together effectively um, to develop and broaden that ownership that we've talked about and to make sure there's real impact? And particularly in those places where actually an emphasis on civil society um, can sometimes be heard as a wish to support political opposition, the, the political sensitivity point that Jessica mentioned. Um, thirdly, what more could the task force and the partnerships that we've just uh, had described uh, between Hedaya, the, the UNDP, uh, OCT and others uh, actually do uh, to really deliver impact uh, in this uh, field? Uh, so with those questions, uh, I open up the floor to uh, comments uh, and questions.